the methodology methods we use for combining and portraying our risk estimates. So how do we combine multiple PFMs into a single risk estimate? Very good. A little bit of math at the end of the day after a lunch and a long week of training. All right. So when we have our risk estimates, they need to be combined um, in an informed manner so that so that the collective impact can be can portrayed in a way that can then be effectively communicated to our decision makers so that we can take appropriate action. So the concepts that I'm going to cover in this module are going to be the little FN versus the big FN charts. We're going to talk about double, double counting of intersections between failure mode probabilities and methods that we can use to address it. And then also talk about some input versus output uncertainty. All right, so risk analysis results are going to typically be portrayed with plots that graphically portray the risk estimates. So it's going to be the likelihood of failure versus potential life loss. And we saw that at the end of our um, Smoky Ridge example. So there are two types of plots that are typically used. Uh, the first one is the one on the left. That's our little FN chart. And the second one is, on the right is going to be the big FN chart. These charts display basically the same information. Uh, they're, they're showing stuff for the societal risk, the risk that impacts the society as a whole. They just do it a little bit differently. So the big FN plots are the, going to be more common with under other industries, while the little FN plots have been useful in illustrating individual potential failure modes relative to agency guidelines that were discussed in a prior presentation. So the little FN chart shows the individual potential failure modes that portray the potential for life loss as the estimated average number of lives that would be lost, and that's down on the x-axis, and the annual probability of failure, little f, and that's associated with the, uh, associated with the probabilities on the y-axis. So in addition to displaying the discrete risk estimates for individual potential failure modes, the total risk for the facility can also be plotted on this chart. A big FN plot shows the cumulative risk posed by all potential failure modes and the associated potential life loss. Now we're not going to show discrete estimates for individual life loss or individual potential failure modes on this plot. So it's basically a cumulative curve showing the probability of n or more lives lost. Uh, both the FN, basically both plots, the little FN chart and the big FN one are going to require quantitative risk estimates to, to create. So to obtain our annual probability of failure for an individual potential failure mode, the event tree probabilities for the unique pathways that lead to failure are multiplied together. We talked about some of this back on Monday, I think. The end products are then going to be summed to get the total APF. And then we'll go through that same process for the other potential failure modes. So on this slide, we see the calculations for potential failure mode number one. The um, the total APF is the sum of the probabilities for the day and night exposure scenarios for the ranges of two um, peak horizontal accelerations that are being considered. And then for us to get the total average annual life loss, we're going to do that in a similar way, but we're going to sum the products of our F and N, the APF times the life loss. That's going to give us our um, average annual life loss, AALL. And then from there, we can then get the average life loss given failure, which is going to be n bar. And that's obtained by dividing the average annual life loss by the annual probability of failure. So then to prepare the data to make the big FN chart, we're going to take the day and night FN pairs for failure, and they're going to be merged um, into a separate list and then sorted from highest n value to lowest n value. Big F is then going to be calculated for each n by summing the little f's for that particular n value and higher. And then when we're finished, the f on the last n should be equal to the APF. So I start with my, let's see my cursor, I cannot. 
So we're going to start with the n value that we're going to get our fn pairs and we're going to sort them. The highest n is first, down to the lowest, and then we'll for um, a given f, we're going to sum all the failure probabilities above it. So for an n of 270, the corresponding f is going to be that 1.7 times 10 to the minus 6 plus 3 times 10 to the minus 6 and then plus 3.1 times 10 to the minus 6 to get 6.1 times 10 to the minus 6. So all the probabilities, all these little f's are going to be summed to get to here. Okay. Now, dam failure by an individual potential failure mode is going to be defined as the occurrence of all the events of a failure mode sequence. Now, remember in the Smoky Ridge example, we had the event tree. We had several different nodes that we evaluated. For breach to occur, we have to have all those events occurring. So in this Venn diagram, that's going to be the intersection of all those events. Now, multiple failure modes are going to typically be apply and be present for a given facility. So the occurrence of any one of those potential failure modes could result in failure. So in this case, the failure event for the facility is going to be a union or basically an OR event where either PFM, in this case, PFMA or PFMB or both at the same time occur. Now, with that in mind, there's going to be th three different options available to us for combining risks. We can ignore the intersection of these two events and just assume that they're mutually exclusive. We can take that intersection and just distribute it between the two different failure modes that we're looking at. Or we can go through the extra effort of enumerating that intersection event. So I'm going to go through these uh, three options. These options are shown in these Venn diagrams here. And we're going to discuss how we do each of those in these next few slides. So first, ignoring the intersection event and its probability. This is the easiest thing to do. So in this case, we're going to take the failure modes, we're going to assume that they're mutually exclusive, and we're just going to sum up their probabilities. Now, this is a reasonable approximation when the total probability is small and when one potential failure mode has a much larger probability than all the other failure modes. So in this case, the intersection is going to be the product of a bunch of small numbers, which are usually small enough to be ignored, and that way we don't inflate the total risk estimate too bad in that case. So option one is just to ignore and sum them up. Option two is going to be to adjust the probabilities, and this is typically what we're going to do in most dam and levy safety risk analysis. So this comes from a procedure that was uh, suggested by Hillett Hall in 2003, and it's a simplified approach for adjusting the system response probabilities for each potential failure mode, which then adjusts the total annual probability of failure and our annual average annual life loss. So in this common cause adjustment methodology, this method is going to redistribute the overlapping areas in the Venn diagrams that we saw to each individual potential failure mode. The magnitude of that redistribution is going to be proportional to the uh, estimated potential probability of failure for each PFM. So the events that have the larger probabilities of failure, they're going to get a larger chunk of that overlapping area. So here we, we have an example calculation for how we would do that for PFM2. We are going to first, we're going to calculate the total probability the combined probability of failure, basically the union of, um, of all those events. So it's going to be one minus the product of the probability of those events not occurring. And then when I take one minus that, I get the, pro the probability of any or all of them occurring. So I take one minus PFM1 times the probability of one minus PFM2 and one minus PFM3 one minus that product is going to give me the total probability of any one of those events, the union, okay? So then I can then weight that by the unadjusted probabilities. So I'm going to take the probability of PFM2 and then divide by the sum of those probabilities multiplied by that total. 
Okay, so I've, I've calculated the um, probability by De Morgan's rule, and then I'm weighting it based on the unadjusted probability. And when I do that, I get a probability of 0.21 for PFM2. It reduced it by some small amount, 0.25 down to 0.21. So when I when I do that, if I do that for each of them and then sum them together, I'm going to get a overall probability of 0.53. If I hadn't done that and summed them straight up, I would have gotten a probability of 0.64. So small adjustment, which is usually the case. Okay. So then the third and the most complicated um, option is going to be to enumerate those intersection events and their probabilities. So what we're saying here is breach can occur by either PFM or theoretically breach could also occur due to both at the same time. And as you get more and more failure modes, this becomes more and more complicated. So when I got two failure modes, it can be A, it could be B, or it can be A and B. If I've got three, it could be A, B, C, A and B, A and C, B and C, all three together. So you see as you start adding failure modes, it becomes way more complicated which is often why we default to the second option. But anyway, the equations here for, um, for each of these mutually exclusive events are shown here. So to get the probability of only A, it would be the probability of A times the probability of B not occurring, 1 minus B. For only B, it would be the probability of B times the probability of A not occurring, or 1 minus A. And then the probability of A to B together, would just be their product. So in total, it simplifies down to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B occurring together. The reason I'm subtracting that out is because the intersection is accounted for twice when I just sum them up, and I gotta eliminate that, okay? So that's the intersection equation that we talked about prior. So let's try this out. We've got a, uh, an example here with two statistically independent potential failure modes, one that's going to result in the breach of an earthen embankment, and then one that results in the breach of a concrete spillway. So in this example, we are given the hazard probability in this first table. We have the system response for both PFM A and B in the second table, and then we've got the uh, consequences for a by itself, B by itself, and then both A and B occurring together. And we're going to go through all the different options. So for option one, when we ignore the intersection event, we're just going to sum the probabilities together. So if you recall, the APF is going to be the probability of your loading times your system response. So I'm going to take my first loading and multiply by the first set of system response. It was zero for both. So that first term is zero. In the second one, I've got a loading probability of nine times 10 to the minus four. And then I'm gonna multiply that by the, um, the system response probability for PFMA summed with the uh, system response for um, PFMB. And then I'm gonna do the same thing for that, for that last loading bin, 10 to the minus four times 0.75 plus 0.95. And that's going to give me an APF of 1.43 times 10 to the minus 3. Now, keep in mind when I'm doing this, for this second bin, 0 0.5 is greater, 0 0.5 plus 0 0.9 is greater than 1, correct? So we just violated some um, rules of probability theory here, but, you know, it is what it is. Same thing on this last one. So by ignoring that, we're saying we don't, it's small enough that we don't care. We'll roll through and calculate. So then for the average annual life loss, that's going to be my APF multiplied by my N value. So you're going to see a lot of these same terms, but now instead of it just being the APF in the parentheses, I'm going to multiply each by their corresponding life loss. So I've got the um, life loss for A added here and B for here, and then the same thing for here and here for that higher loading and I get an average annual life loss of about 9.5 times 10 to the minus 2. Okay. So then option two 
using De Morgan's rule is going to be where we ignore the intersection event, but then distribute the probability. And this is going to basically be, become our common cause adjustment. We're going to reduce the probabilities. That way, we're not going to be violating our uh, rules of probability theory anymore. When we do this, we are going to get the correct annual probability of failure. However, because we're not accounting for that intersection event, we're just distributing it, our average annual life loss is going to be out off by some small amount. So here we've got how the probabilities would change um, by um, once we, we, we take this, this first part right here. This is going to be the correct probability, the numerator here, and then we're going to weight it by the unadjusted probability and we're going to get 0.34. So that took probability of A down from 0.5 to 0.34. We do the same thing for B, which was originally 0.9. That's going to drop to 0.61. And we'll see that the sum of those two numbers, 0.34 and 0.61, are now less than 1. We, we're not violating any rules anymore. We do the same thing for the upper stage, and we get an APF of 0.954 when we do that. And then same procedure that we saw on the prior slide for the average annual life loss, we get something around 6.3 times 10 to the minus 2. So real quick, just comparing, I went from 1.4 times 10 to the minus 3 down to 9.5 times 10 to the minus 4. A small difference, not huge, okay? And then average annual life loss went from 9 times 10 to the minus 2 down to 6 times 10 to the minus 2. Now, lastly, we can spend more calories and enumerate the intersection event and its probability. So we're counting for all the different outcomes, A only, B only, and A and B evaluated together. And we showed these equations on the prior slide. When we go through and do that, I mean, this is going to be the most correct way to statistically combine these independent events. It's simple and straightforward in this example. But like I said, once you start getting into four, you know, three or more failure modes, it starts to become really challenging and complex and trying to keep in everything straight. Plus, it dramatically increases the number of consequence scenarios that you need to evaluate. So I've got, doing it this way, I can get my probabilities for just A, just B, and then A and B for both stages. And I get the APF, same APF that I got prior, 9.54 times 10 to the minus 4. But we now will get an increase in the average annual life loss because I'm accounting for the probability of both account happening at the same time in both of those bins. Okay. So when we compare the options, you can see that really both options one and two do a pretty good job of estimating the risk for this particular example. Option one is going to overestimate the APF, but does a pretty good job with the average annual life loss. Right. Option two is going to give us the correct annual probability of failure, but it slightly underestimates the average annual life loss. So with regards to the FN chart, plotting the individual PFMs, assuming independence along with the total risk based on interaction or yeah, based on the interactions between the failure modes is always going to be recommended. So we'll plot the um, individual risks or the risk associated with PFM A only and PFM B only along with the totals. And you can see there really isn't much difference with how they plotted. So a lot of it's going to be trying to decide when it matters and when you need to use each of these events. Otherwise, you can do whatever's simplest. So here we're going to consider a, um, the following potential failure mode where we have an earthquake that occurs, we have a liquefiable layer that exists in the foundation, uh, continuous liquefaction is triggered, we get some slope instability, and then um, crest loss exceeds the available freeboard, resulting in an uncontrolled release of the reservoir. So one thing that we can do is we can use a Monte Carlo here. Um, use a Monte Carlo results in a variety of different ways for this potential failure mode. So for node 4 here, slope instability occurs, we can do a probabilistic analysis and get the get probabilities directly from that analysis. 
That's not recommended, but you could do that. Um, the second thing you can do is you can use that analysis uh, as a starting point for event four and then make adjustments on that probability based on the other factors that you have. That's what's um, most common and most recommended. And then lastly, you can make your estimate and then qualitatively you know, uh, evaluate that based on your more and less likely factors like we did for the um, Smoky Ridge example. So with regards to uncertainty and how we portray it, there's going to be many ways in which uncertainty can be portrayed and um, communicated to our decision makers. So some of the examples that I'm showing on this slide, this first one in the top left is basically a point cloud, a scatter plot of all the FN, um, FN points that were generated from a probabilistic analysis, very similar to what we just did on the Smoky Ridge example. You can um, create various percentiles that can be plotted on the big FN chart to show how the probability of life loss distribution changes. You can show the APF or um, average annual life loss as either a probability density function or a cumulative distribution function. And then you can also show the results as box and whisker plots. And there's other options out there that aren't being shown on this slide too. So a bunch of different ways and what way you use to communicate is going to depend on your project and your results and what you're trying to communicate. But I would say that these two, or really these three that are shown right here are probably the most common with regards to showing final risk estimates. So we briefly talked about Monte Carlo simulation earlier, and that's going to be an analysis that's used to evaluate output uncertainty when we've got analytical solutions that are difficult uh, or don't exist. So basically, a cumulative density function is going to be developed for our uncertain inputs, and then each of those functions is going to be randomly sampled a bunch of times, and then that sampling is then going to correspond to that random variable. And this is called inverse uh, transform sampling. So then we're going to build an output distribution over those multiple iterations or trials. And if we do enough iterations, then the output mean is going to converge, and that's going to result in a probability distribution for our model outputs. Now, when it comes to probability distributions, there's going to be a wide variety that are available to describe your random variables. Um, some of the more common ones, which I think Dave Margo touched on on Monday, include the uniform distribution. We've got triangular, normal, log normal, PERT, and then Weibull. Um, some other distributions that are available, like the inverse Gaussian and beta distributions, may be more appropriate for particular applications, like we use inverse Gaussian at the upper end of our stage frequency curves to fit those distribution, fit, the, fit that data. And then sometimes we use the beta distribution when we start looking at consequences. Now, we need to be careful of distributions that span several orders of magnitude because um, the mean can end up being skewed towards the upper bound unless we take some care. So it's just something to be aware of. So in the next few slides, we'll go through the steps for performing a Monte Carlo analysis. Uh, the first step is to build a risk model and a, a very simple event tree analysis for a spillway erosion PFMs shown here on the slide. The first event is a flood that exceeds the spillway crest. And then the second event is spillway erosion and breach given the spillway flood. The spillway flood event has a one in a thousand annual exceedance probability, and the conditional probability of failure is one in 16, which then results in an estimated life loss of 30. So in step two, um, we can assign appropriate distributions to the model. So in this example, a log normal distribution is used for the flood hazard. We're using a triangular distribution for the spillway erosion and breach, and then a normal distribution for the life loss given that breach occurs. 
So then in step three, we're going to sample the inputs randomly. So for each iteration, a random number is going to be generated between zero and one, and then a value is going to be sampled from the cumulative probability distribution that corresponds to the random number. And then we're going to compile the outputs. So the more and more we do this, the more and more output data we have, and the expected value for each iteration can then be plotted, and then we can generate what is sometimes referred to as that point cloud that we saw a few um, earlier. And then lastly, some other options for portraying sensitivity and uncertainty. On the left is going to be the tornado plot, and that's going to show what variable the output is most sensitive to. That's a common um, plot that can be generated automatically from an at-risk analysis if you have that program. Um, in the middle, that would be used to assess the uh, influence of a single parameter on an output. In this case, we've got friction angle versus the sliding limit state, so we can see how the limit state's changing based on what friction angle we're using. And then lastly, uh, we can do sensitivity on um, this one is showing how the risk changes with specific assumptions to uh, operability of Tainer gates. So in this first one, that's the best estimate, which assumes that um, the gates hold. Let's see if I can read that. After brakes are inundated at the bottom, that's assuming that the gates stay partially open, and then the worst case would be if they all, uh, we have a complete power failure and none of them were open from the beginning. So that's a, a simple way that's not probabilistic to show how the results can change and give uh, decision makers um, information and show your, um, how sensitive the result is to certain uncertain parameters and inputs. All right, any questions on anything that I just covered? What questions do we have? Okay. We mathed out. Yeah. You're right. It is the best time for math. Late in the day on a Friday after lunch at the end of a before a test long training 100%. course. Any questions on our methodology for combining or portraying risk? Okay, come on. On slide 17, you have a vari the variety of different um, graphs here. I was wondering if you could go into a little more detail on what you each one of these would, when you would use each one of these. Sure. So most, most of these are pretty standard. When we do a quantitative risk assessment, we're typically going to try to put that point cloud in with both our total and our potential failure modes. Um, that gives the decision makers a sense of what our uncertainty is, what we think we don't know. We try to put a range on it. Um, in this particular case, it's kind of borderline, but if we were to have both my expected probability and that whole cloud below the average annual life loss guideline, that's gonna give decision makers some confidence that, hey, even, with, even if we take the worst case of our uncertain parameters, we're still going to be. You're, we're still going to meet that guideline. Same deal if everything plots above. We should probably take some um, expedited action. The um, percentiles on the big FN plot kind of show the same thing. You get a sense for, um, I guess, how likely we are to exceed that guideline. If only the highest of the high exceeds it, then we're more comfortable when we start evaluating TRG number one. Um, we typically don't report um, probability, the PDFs, the probability density functions. We usually go more with the cumulative function over here. And what's helpful here is this will show you what percentage of your points um, plot, or, plot above or below a specific limit. So if you look at that one there, all the, all the, this one is for annual probability of failure. You see all the points plot below that dashed line of 10 to the minus four. So they can't see the cursor. This is the yeah, yeah. probability density function here. This is the cumulative density function. Big FN, yeah. little FN, there you go. And basically what you can say here is if I go 10 to the minus five here, I can say that 
are at or below 10 to the minus 5. So that's where that one comes in. Uh, the box and whisker plots are usually shown with uh, consequence estimates. It'll give you the 25, the 50, and 70 percentiles, and also the min and the max. Very good. Any other questions? If you really like this stuff, um, there is another RMC course out there, DLS 105, that's actually going right now. I think it's going to be offered again in January where we get th go through all the painstaking details of how to do all this stuff.